this is class three of the fourth chapter. As we said, we're going to please God for the next probably maybe even a year, just be focusing on this book called uh, the, the Gate of Trust, Shara B'Tophon. Super complex. So this is class three of Shara B'Tophon. And let's go to it. So last week we learned that the first benefit of B'Tophon, says the Chobos Savovas, is that you can have complete reliance on Asher. And therefore you should be able to sleep like a baby, be relaxed anytime you worry. And I hope you're implementing what we're learning in your week. And I hope you are starting to process. If you start getting worried in the week, that's a lack of pitach. And that means you need to come back to the book. Okay, why am I getting worried? It means I haven't let go. It means I haven't given up to Hashem. So I hope this, this Sunday night, my dear friends, is meant to be a, a growth session. It's meant to be something that you incorporate in your personal life. It's something that I'm hoping during your week during your Shabbat, you can, oh, I'm worrying. That means I haven't got my bitofen yet. Yes, I'm getting my bitofen. You should be going on the roller coaster of bitofen. So, so let's see where we go to tonight. So we're up to the second benefit. So it's the words in Hebrew, umehen. And it goes like this. Here we go. Nice to see everybody on Instagram, Facebook. Stay with us. Don't go anywhere. This is going to be big stuff. Here we go. Says this great sage who was written a thousand years ago, Rabbeinu Bahai, thousand years ago, and he writes this book in, in deep Kabbalistic terms, and it goes like this: Another benefit is someone who puts trust in Hashem. Someone who puts trust in Hashem. So that means now you'll no longer be subservient to anyone else. In other words, you're either you're always going to be a slave in this world. Are you a slave to Hashem, slave to your ego, or some people a slave to their boss, some people like me to their wife, right? Or, or, or all sorts of different sla um, serve slaves we have, different masters. And therefore, think about it. If you don't have bitofen, and I really, it's sad someone who doesn't have bitofen. That means, let's say you're working. And you've got, let's say, a really tough boss. You think it's that boss is paying your wages. And you think if you don't please him, then you're not going to get paid and you're not going to be able to pay the bills. Wrong. Wrong. Hashem's deciding how much money you're going to earn. And Hashem decides what bills you're going to pay. And if, God forbid, Hashem decides you need to go through a challenge financially, then Hashem will put it into the mind of your boss to end things. So your boss is not your master. Hashem is your master. And therefore, if you think your boss is your master, you're going to be relying and being subservient to him and being trying to flatter him or her. The Shalaya Kabbala Ish. You'll be putting your hope in people. By the way, never put your hope in people because everyone will always let you down. That's why I always say to people, like, never assume. Never assume, never rely on someone because then they can't let you down. Only person you should rely on, only, sorry, entity you should rely on is on Hashem, is on God. Because if you, and it's saying a benefit will be that by relying on Hashem, you won't be a subservient to anyone else. You won't have hope for any man, nor await assistance from human beings. If any of you waiting for help from someone, waiting for that call to be made, waiting, waiting for this person to come and save you because I've got news for you. You're going to keep on wait, waiting until you put your reliance on Hashem. Once you put your reliance on Hashem, you won't have to wait a, a thing. And you'll be able to move forward. I'll give you an example. So let's say for me and my wife, our plan is to go and start working in Tel Aviv in, in, in October. And we need to raise the money to do that. So you could argue that only once all the money's been raised, do we then say we're going to go. So we're waiting and our whole plans are awaiting some exciting, amazing philanthropists and donors to say, come on, we want to help you. But that's not Bitochen. Bitochen is we go. We just go. We're going either way. We're going. Yalla, we're going. With Hashem's help, Hashem will send the salvations we need. See the difference? Everyone, you see the difference? You know, position A is I'll only do X when 
something physical comes my way. Position B is, if it's what Hashem wants, be doing it, come what may. We're only relying on Hashem. We're relying on Hashem. And when we know Hashem wants us to do it, so Hashem wants us to do it, it'll work out somehow, some way. Do you see the difference? You see the difference? So, so then the Ramchal says, sorry, then the Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says, you won't have to try and curry favor with them. There's this nice phrase. There's this nice phrase to this idea of currying favor with people. Currying favor with people means, and this is where things get very messed up. If any of you ever had to do something a little bit unethical, a bit, you've had to flatter, you've had to compromise maybe some of your standards, some of your ethics, put yourself in a vulnerable situation just to flatter someone in power. The person without bitachon could do that. You know, I just literally, you're reading about what's, what's happening to the, the British soon to be ex prime minister. And it seems that there was all sorts of people that he was saying, if you do this to me, I'll get you this job. And if you do this for me, I'll get you this job. An incredibly un unethical and probably unlawful, but how messed up that, that an individual or a, a young woman thinks that if I'm nice to the prime minister, if I'm nice at that point, but to the mayor of London, then I'll get a, I'll, I'll get a good job. You know, the whole Me Too movement is, is based on, on especially young women saying, okay, in order to get a job, I'll just have to do something a little bit unethical. That is the world we're living in. But my dear friends, we, sh we should not be living in that world. We should be living in the world of Bitochen, where in the world of Bitochen, you're only putting your reliance on Hashem. And if you're only putting your reliance on Hashem, you don't have to do unethical, improper, inappropriate, compromising actions to curry favor because the only entity you've got to curry favor with is with Hashem. That means you've got to go stubborn three times a day. That means you've got to try and do mitzvahs. That means you've got to give charity. That means you've got to tick the boxes that Hashem wants you to tick. So you don't have to tick any unethical, inappropriate, vulgar human beings box. Baruch Hashem. Do you see the difference? My dear friends, you have a choice. Which world do you want to live in? Do you want to live in the world of Boris Johnson and the world that you've got to seek to curry favor from inappropriate individuals and compromise yourself or do you say no i'm only going to rely on Hashem, and therefore i do what's right i do what's right full stop and i'm never going to put myself in a situation which hashem doesn't want me to be put into and then he says you should flatter people flattery is awful have you seen that sometimes people literally they're saying lies that's saying deceiving comments just to somewhat flatter because you think if you flatter you're going to be popular and you're going to get invited to a party or you get maybe a promotion that's the world of lies my friends that's Ola Masheke. don't be sucked into the world of lies and some of you just say rabbi hill what are you talking about you don't know how the world works you're right hey baruch hashem i don't physically know how the world works but i know theoretically how the world works and it's wrong it's how not to function, because the Gemara speaks about it. There's two options. There's the world of lies, and that you could succeed seemingly by flattering people, but then ultimately you won't succeed, and ultimately you'll maybe end up in therapy or end up in prison or end up distraught. So it's mostly actually in the end unhealthy and doesn't work. Or we could live in the world of truth, in the world of Torah, in the world of the only one you're having rely on, reliance on is Hashem, and that's blissful. And that's beautiful, and that's serene, and that's tranquil, tranquil. And then there's no need to be unethical in any shape, way, or form. And there's no flattery. You're just real. You're real with people. The low yaskim in my ability, and you, you won't have to acquiesce at odds with the service of Hashem. Do you know any of my students say to me, Rabbi, what do I do in order for me to continue my job? That means I've got to go to this party. I've got to go and eat this this food. I've got to go over Shabbos. I've got to break the Torah in so many ways in order for my job to, to grow my job. That's how not to be. Please don't ever make that mistake. Don't think 
that by breaking the Torah, you're going to gain in this world. You will never gain long time, ultimately, long term from breaking the Torah, ever. You might think you will, you might, it might seem enticing, but ultimately you will not. And therefore, how many times I've seen people that Dafko Hashem tests you. One of my dear friends, Alex Clare, when he became about to shiver and became wanted to keep the Torah, at that point his pop career was taking off. And it's quite hard to be a pop star and to be Shema Shabbos. But he made a decision. He's going to go to you. He's, he's going to start growing. What happens? Hashem tests him. And if you've heard of the pop singer Adele, Adele comes and calls him and says, you're going to be my support act on my show. And Alex says, awesome, amazing. When is it? April, fantastic. What night? 10th of April, awesome. Let me look. Uh-oh, first night Seder. It was the first night Pesach. First night Pesach. Hashem was tempting him. This is what exactly the Chobos of Obviously said. Are you going to go and just, is, just do what Adele wants and, and do what your, very much his agent wanted? Or are you just going to follow the Torah? The Torah says you don't you shouldn't be playing gigs on Seder night. You should be sitting in a Seder night. So amazingly, Alex found the strength to say no to Adele and yes to Pesach. And then Hashem said, I'm not done with you yet. He waited a few months. And then got another amazing gig with the BBC, Jules Holland. Very exciting. When was that performance? Sukkot. Sukkot, he had to be tested once more just to see, and he had to turn that down. And after he turned down the death, the best song, and then he turned down Jules Holland, the Sukkot, then he just went to Yeshiva and said, I'm done with this. His agent got rid of him. His agent said, you're mad, you're sugar. You're crazy. As you probably said, the word sugar. He said, you're, you're just nuts. Because do you know how many people will do anything just to get a gig with Adele and Jules, Jules Holland? You just turn them down. I can't be your agent. He goes to Yeshiva, and what happens? Microsoft come calling and say, we love your song too close. Could we use it for our ad? And all of a sudden he makes everything he needs with too close from his learning in Yeshiva. So he was too close to Hashem or Hashem in a good way. He was so close. He had such to us to Hashem. Hashem gave him Microsoft and had the most, one of the most famous songs of all time. Maybe James can put it on our link. Alex Clare, too close. And, and it's a true story. And that's, that's what the Chobos of Obos is saying. Most people would say, you're crazy. You've got, a, you've got an option with Adele, you break Pesa. You get an option with Jules Solomon, you break Sukkot. The Torah says you don't. Because you've got to understand, are we here for now? Or are we here for long term? So to be Hashem's servant, to be of service, to keep the Torah, irrespective of we might seemingly lose out money in, in, in the short term, which by the way, you won't. By the way, you won't. You'll never lose money. You'll never lose money for for Torah. I was in a cab once in, in Israel and it's amazing how holy these cab drivers are and I'm having this chat with this cab driver and he says, you might not want to get in the cab, Arav, and, and you know, and you know Shabbat, and Shabbat, and you know, and you know hey, God, Shabbat. I drive on Shabbat, he said to me. So I said, I said, why? Why do you have to drive on Shabbat? So he said to me, he said to me, I have to drive on Shabbat, you know, I can't afford, I need to pay. I need to, you know, I need to, I need to uh, pay for my children. I need to pay for the bills. I said to him, Taseli Tova, I said, do me a favor. Just try one Shabbat, one Shabbat. It says in the Torah, you'll never lose money for keeping the Torah. It says on the contrary, you should work for six days and then you should keep the Shabbat. He says, meaning you'll get tremendous blessing and you'll never be harmed financially from keeping Shabbat. So just try one week, one week. Next week, take a day off, take, off, take all the day on Shabbat. And then see by the end of the week how much money you make. And here's my card. Call me. Anyway, I never thought I'd hear from him again. And amazingly, the end of the next week, he calls me, Arav, Arav, you won't believe it. It's crazy. I didn't work on Shabbat and I made more money. Wow. Maxim, amazing. Magic. From now on. And it was a true story and it works. And, and maybe one day Hashem will test you. Maybe Hashem will test you. And let's see if you can stand up to it. It's hard. It's not easy. It's not easy. My father once was teaching someone. He was helping someone convert. And, and they had they had very, very expensive art, which included certain idols, which was idolatry. 
like special like Buddhist idols and Buddhist statues and, and Hindu stuff and, 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 and stuff which the Torah says is called Avodah Zarah, idolatry. And my dad wasn't compromising in any shape, way or form and said, good to get rid of it. Even if it could be like, because you can't even get benefit from idolatry. Can you imagine? I didn't get benefit from idolatry. So the guy literally at that point had to lose out thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands, probably tens of thousands of thousands. But in the end, made it back, made it back. So sometimes we've got to do what we've got to do. That's why you have to, you have, to have a rabbi. You need to be able to have the authority to understand what's in these holy books behind me, to be able to understand what's in the code of Jewish law, to be able to understand if you've got a dilemma, what you need to do. But in short, we don't. Making money is not an excuse for breaking the Torah. <laughs> Sorry to say. It's not like, oh, but I need to make money. That doesn't mean I can break the Torah. If someone offered me this Shabbat, a billion pounds, one billion pounds to break Shabbat. I'm not allowed to break Shabbat. And I wouldn't. I wouldn't break Shabbat for a billion pounds because it doesn't mean 10 billion pounds because money is money. Hashem is eternal. So let's continue. And then he says like this. Says... So you should never have to flatter or carry favor with anyone or flatter people because you're you're betochens with Hashem. You you don't have betochen on your boss, on any human being, only on God. And therefore, even if they're powerful, their stature will not intimidate you. You won't even be afraid of confrontation because Hashem is watching over you. Can you imagine getting this this beautiful level, my dear friends, that you're never going to be scared of anybody ever again? Because Hashem is the real big boss. Hashem is making the decisions. How much money is coming in is from God. How healthy you are is from God. If you're going to get married or not from Hashem. If once you understand that Hashem is holding not just the purse strings, but every single string. You know, the fact that I had a sore throat last week and that meant I couldn't dub the Shabbat. That was from Hashem. Hashem decided that for whatever reason. Once you get that every little thing that happens is from God, then all of a sudden, you're not afraid of people that you might be afraid of. You're not scared of big, who, you know, it doesn't matter. You shouldn't be intimidated if you're like with very, you know, some people are so intimidated by a pop star or by a famous sportsman or a celebrity, which by the way is the funniest thing to be intimidated by a celebrity, really, just because they went on Big Brother or, or an island, the, you know, where no one's showing their gear. Does that mean, does, does that mean that, I, that all of a sudden I have to worship them? We should only thing you should worship is Hashem. That's what we're learning from this. And therefore you shouldn't, you won't be scared, which by the way is an amazing thing. That means any of you who are dating or want to date, instead of being like very nervous just before the date, you really has your faith in Hashem. Nothing to be nervous about. If he's the one, he's the one. If not, not. Very simple. You know, and, 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 and if he doesn't think you're the one, then it's his loss and you're not meant to, you're not meant soul, you're not soulmates. Once you understand, once you've really got Hashem in your life, there's no reason to be depressed. There's no reason to be intimidated. And then he writes, on the contrary, by relying solely on Hashem, he will be able to throw off himself the heavy garments of other people's favors, the way on a person. And they'll rid himself of the burden of excessive thanking them and the obligation to repay them for their favors. You've heard of this phrase of, if, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It's like, okay, you've you got to do a favor for me. And it's amazing, by the way. It's just amazing that I'm learning this at the same time as we're seeing total the opposite in English politics right now. It's been carnage for anybody who follows politics especially in the uk it's absolutely bedlam where you know, they, they basically boris johnson offered some people a job they said yes the next day they stabbed him in the back he's stabbing them in the back everyone's stabbing everyone in the back now you've got all these tories saying i'm going to be the leader and you do i'll if you vote for me i'll give you this favor and if you do that and neither of that and then and everyone knows everyone's gonna lay each other down the whole thing is nonsense what a fun what a Bunch of hypocrites, sorry to say. It's, it's hypocritical, it's nonsensical. And what the Chavis of is saying, that when you're relying on Hashem, you don't have to demean yourself to say, okay, uh, I'll do this for you, and I'll do that for you, and I'll do that for you. It's very simple. You just do what's right. And then you trust Hashem is going to help you. Come what may. And then he writes, <laughs> If they do wrong, he rebukes them. And he will not be overly cautious with their pride. And he, and he should not need to humiliate them for their sins. He will not be ashamed before them. And therefore, one will not varnish their falsehoods and minimize their evil. So what's he saying? 
What's he saying? He's saying the following. My dear friends, the only one we should be afraid of per se is God himself. That's the only, only time we should, be, we should be afraid. Jacob said that in the Torah. It said that he was afraid. He wasn't afraid of Esau. He wasn't afraid of his brother trying to kill him. He wasn't afraid of his 400 men. He was afraid, it says in Rashi, maybe he's made mistakes. He's done some sins. He wasn't able to honor his father, Yitzchak. We should be afraid. Maybe we haven't done honoring our parents. We should be afraid. Maybe you embarrass someone. You should be afraid. Maybe you haven't maximized your, 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 your potential. You haven't given enough charity. That's what should make us afraid. We shouldn't be afraid of a certain business meeting we're having. We shouldn't be afraid of a interview we're having. The most important interview in your day is when you pray to Hashem. That's your interview. Because that unlocks every door. When you daven chakras in the morning. That's an interview with God for your next six hours of your day. And if you do that well, then everything will go well. And if you fail that interview, things might not go so well. Meaning if that goes well, then your business and your health and, and how you drive the car. You know, it's funny. I've got this really old car and it's great. It's a great Bitochum car. I've had it like forever, this car. And every time I start, oh, say Baruch Hashem, because I'm very aware, my name might, might not start. Any day, it just might stop. You know, the fact that when it works, it's awesome. It's like, oh, it's amazing. It's teaching me gratitude. To be, this is one of the things when it just like, it starts in the morning, I say, thank you, Hashem. You know, instead of just being complacent and expecting everything to work perfectly, where we're the self-entitled, spoiled beings, the Chavis of Ovis is telling us that only should only, only, only put our reliance on Hashem and specifically this second benefit, not on people. That's the first one. Next, let's continue. Now, the third benefit, Omehen. Omehen, the third benefit, the one who trusts in Hashem, is the token will bring him to a feeling of security, enabling him to clear his mind from worldly matters and to focus on his attention relating to the service of Hashem. Let me explain. Here's where it gets complex, everybody. And we sp- we've mentioned this in previous weeks, but we have to mention it again. There's a principle called hishtadlus, which means you've got to put your effort in. We can't just rely on a miracle. You can't just be praying all day and expect money to rain down from heaven like it used to in the time of the, uh, in the, time of the desert. It doesn't do that anymore. So yes, you've got to go to work. For those of you who want to get married, you can't just be sitting at home all day watching Netflix expecting the postman to be knock on the door, which, by the way, Cyril's a postman. So anyone who lives near Cyril and, and fancies him should go and, uh, you know, maybe um, ask Cyril to post him a letter, right? But so, so but you can't expect just the postman or the delivery driver or the Amazon package man to be your soulmate, even though it could be. You can't expect that. Hashem wants to do that, he can. You do need to go out sometimes to events. You might need to go to a matchmaker. You might need to do what's called this thing. However, what the problem is, most people in the world of lies start getting caught up in the lies. They start thinking that, oh my gosh, I'm nervous about the swiping. I'm no one swiping me at the moment. All the wrong people are swiping me at the moment. So I've got a huge interview. Oh my gosh, I've got this huge interview. I mean, I've got to do, be my best for the interview. And you put so much work in the Shadlus, you haven't got time for God. And you haven't got time to pray. I know a lot of people, it's perverse. Because they've got such a big interview coming, so they've got to put all their prep for the interview and there's no time for praying. That's perverse, everybody. That's missed the point. Because the person who's on the divine providence realm, the person that should be playing the Bitochen game, the priority should be if you're praying at a certain time, that comes what may. You shouldn't even change the time, ideally. And if you do need to change the time, you change the time. You know, we could start davening this morning. 4.30 in the morning is the first Minion in, in, in gold is green every morning. 4.30 is the first chakras with a minion in sunrise. So even if it's, let's say you even have an eight o'clock minion. So fine. Yeah, sorry, eight o'clock meeting. So go and pray first. Six o'clock, five o'clock. We don't make time in our life for God enough. And it says the Chobha Sabobas, if you start, my friends, having Bitochen, that will all of a sudden free up time in your life. 
I'll give you an example just for me so you just start seeing it. So I'm just saying to you right now, one of my um, areas of Ishtadlis is I've got to raise the money for Tel Aviv. So in, so how, how, how much should I be doing every day for that? Should I just be on the phone every day? Should I be knocking on doors every day? Should I be sending emails every day? Or should I be doing one a day? Or 10 a day? Or one hour a day? It's very hard to know the balance. It's very hard. And by the way, the Kabbalistic solution, says Rabbi Dessler, is I've got to do something that makes the vessel. But to do it to the level that if things don't work, I won't have regrets. So let's just say if I was the happy to send one email out a day, and then God forbid, and when I need to go to Israel, we haven't got the money, and I'll say, oh, I should have done more, then I'm not ready to do just one email a day. Do you understand this, everybody? So let, let's say someone who's looking to date, they're saying, how, how much should I be dating? How much should I be being proactive in the dating? So you've got to set for yourself a bar that if things didn't work, you won't regret. So, for example, if you say, I'm going to go on one app, and that's it, I'm going to go on JSwipe. And, and if it's meant to be, you'll be through JSwipe. And then if things weren't to work out in a year, you won't say, oh, I should have done more. If you would have said, no, no, I should have been on JSwipe and Tinder, then you need to do both. Do you understand? Heshtadlis works based on your level. So what I'm trying to get at for me, on one hand, my Yitzhahara will want me just to be doing Heshtadlis to try and raise the money all day. My Yitzhah is saying, you know what? Maybe one email a week is enough. I'm not on the level. I personally think one email a week for me could be, I might be just being a bit lazy. I don't think I'm being real to that. So I'm trying to, to basically do one thing a day. That's what I'm trying to do. Like one thing a day, one thing a day. And then if Hashem wants, you know, that one thing could be enough for, for, for the year if Hashem wants it to be. So what I'm trying, and then by only doing one thing, that frees me up to be able to pray longer, to be able to study Torah longer, to be able to, do more forgiving to people because I've got less time I need to put in the area of my financial um, procuring, my, my financial growth, because I'm trying to put my more of it, my bitokhan than Hashem, and if it's meant to be, it will be. And therefore, my actual time I'm able to put in Torah time. Do you understand? That's what the Chobos of Obos is saying, because there's only 24 hours in a day. We haven't yet invented a way to have 30 hours in a day. People are trying. But as of yet, no one's succeeding in that. If any of you have got an app which can enable us to have 30 hours a day, I'm happy to partner you in that. But right now, it seems that that's probably not going to happen. So we've got only 24 hours in a day. So you do only have 24 hours. And by the way, you've got to actually ask yourself, how many hours should you be sleeping every day? And, and it's very interesting that the, the Rambam seems to say between six and eight. I personally believe if you really want to stretch yourself and want to be amazing, Maybe you can go five and a half hours or five hours because you know, I definitely know some of the greats, like my teacher, the rabbi behind me, only sleeps two and a half hours a day, two, uh, two and a half hours a night. And he's 74, 75 now. So it's possible. But you've got to know your level to be able to sleep shortly. But the point is, we have to decide what we should be utilizing in our day and what the Chobos of Obos is saying. One of the benefits of Pitochon is now you've got more hours in your day for spiritual matters because you're not so stressed out about worldly matters because for worldly matters, you're giving it over to Hashem. That's the point. So with, with your serene spirits, you should be relaxed. You should have minimal worries, worldly affairs. And then he goes into this very interesting analogy. And we're going to be speaking about an alchemist. Anybody know was it an alchemist? So again, this was a thousand years ago he wrote this. So a thousand years ago, there was some some of these um, kind of magicians. It was a genuine skill that basically provided people a comfortable income. Now today, what we'll call it a modern day alchemist could be someone, but essentially what they were, an alchemist, for those who don't know, maybe James can put a link to what an alchemist is, but I'll tell you from what I know, it's someone who would make cheap metals look like precious ones, and would pass them off as genuine gold and silver. And they would be able to, people without working hard would make a lot of money. They'd be one of the wealthiest in society. Because some people believed it was possible to change other metals into gold and silver. Anyway, so 
modern day alchemy could be something like, I believe counterfeiting. If any of you, and please don't do this because Hashem does not want you to do this. But if any of you, God forbid, were in the trade of forging notes, you know, making dollars in your printing machine, you're just fake, fake money, counterfeiting money. Can you imagine someone had that? So in theory, they're just printing money and they're getting away with it. So the person that does that on, on one hand seemingly is le leading a very serene life. It's criminals, a lot of criminals, they don't have to do much to have a lot, seemingly. And he says, therefore, there is a little bit of a comparison with Bitochen, because Bitochen, again, you have to, you're doing a little and you're receiving a lot. But then he says, so many, so many differences. So for example, so a person who knows how to convert silver to gold and copper to tin to silver using scientific knowledge and technique, and furthermore, the one who trusts in Hashem is better off than the alchemist in 10 ways. In 10 ways. So someone's saying on, on Fletcher Blemish is saying on, on Instagram that the alchemist used to turn the metal to gold. We're saying that. We're saying that. But what we're saying, ironically, what we're saying, ironically, is when, when you're cheating, when you're lying, when you're faking, when you're making counterfeit money, for example, that actually is deceitful. That, that's into the world of lies. And what, on the other hand, on the other hand, it's seemingly very serene. Someone, if you can imagine, just, you could print as much money as you want. So that means there's a benefit of that, that now you've got a lot of time to do what, what other things you want, because you're not stressing, you're not joining the rat race in a sense. But the Chobah Sababa says there's 10 benefits to Bitachon over being able to print forged money. Here we go. But what are the 10 benefits? Let's try and do this quick. Benefit number one. An alchemist needs specific items. Even the alchemist, though, he still needs items. He needs tools without which he can't accomplish anything. He can't be assured that he'll find these items every time. But by contrast, if you just have trust in Hashem 24-7, wherever you are in the world, What's beautiful about Hashem is, as the song goes, Hashem is here, Hashem is there, Hashem is every, truly everywhere. Uh, he's everywhere. Wherever you are, you could be on holiday in Alaska, Hashem's there. You could be literally on a rocket to the moon, Hashem's there. Where, wherever you are, Hashem is with you. Hashem is with you, loving you, nurturing you, looking after you, hugging you, embracing you, wherever you are. You know, you, the only thing you need is your bitachon. The only thing you need is magic bitachon. It's real magic. It's just, I trust Hashem is going to look after me. And by the way, I really recommend in your prayers, you just say over and over again until it starts internalizing. And I have been talking to Hashem. I have been talking. One of the ways to do it, maybe is to say the 13 principles of Animam into the Rambam, to say that, to say to Hillen, just to say, but even to say affirmations, I am giving it over, I'm handing over my worries to Hashem. But let's say, let's say you have a worry about, oh, you want to get married. So I'm handing over that to Hashem, that worry. Let's say you've got to worry about making money handing over that worry whatever your worry is you literally make a declaration in your davening at the end of your amida and you say i'm handing this over to hashem you're just giving it over to god give it over and therefore unlike the alchemist you you don't need anything for that you just need you and god you know, hashem is with you so you just need faith that's the benefit of faith it doesn't cost next Next, what's the next one? Number two. By the way, it's a, be it's a beautiful, beautiful line. One of my favorite verses from Tehillim. He said it last week. We'll say it again. Young lions may Tehillim chapter thirty-four, verse eleven. Kefirim Roshu Varaivu Vadoshe Hashem Young lions may want and hunger. There's a lot of young lions in this world, but those who but they're still hungry. Those who seek out Hashem will not lack any good. As then it says in the next verse, Hashem Fear Hashem, you, his holy ones, for those who fear him lack nothing. Meaning if you really fear Hashem, and by the way, we're going to speak in future weeks, the correlation between fearing Hashem and Bitochen, it's very interesting, we need to understand, it seems it's a stepping stone to have fear of God, which we'll talk about another time. But if you really have bit often, you'll never lack anything. Now, there's a big question. That's to Hillim, Cyril. Yes, yeah, Psalms. 
That's the book of Psalms of King David. Chapter 34, verse 11. Check it out. So I've got a question. You know, we say, we say, and I was young, I never saw a tzaddik who was, who is Ne'ezav, who is forsaken the Zarum of Akish Lachem with his offspring beseeching bread. I never saw someone who was close to Hashem, who was, po- who was poor. But what are you talking about? I know so many poor people who are very, who have bitafen. You know, bitafen, I see people who are sick, who have bitafen. I, be, I see people who are poor, I see people who are single, who have bitafen. What does it mean that all of you have bitafen, you have everything? So I think the answer is the following. I think the answer is the following. I think the answer is very deep that you're not forsaken. That's the first point. You know, sometimes you feel you're all alone. And if you feel this, you just feel Hashem is not with you. You feel you're isolated. You feel no one's picking up on the line. You feel nothing's going your way. That normally is a sign that you've got to work harder on your, your bitachem. Hashem's trying to say to you, come on, give it to me more. Like, give it over to me more. You're, you're still holding on to the keys. You're still holding on to the worries. If we really, genuinely give over all our worries to Hashem, the closeness is always there. Now, there were some of the greatest tzaddikim who were through the Holocaust, like the Klausenberger Rebbe, who was his, his New York site last week. He survived the Holocaust, but he went through hell on earth. So he doesn't mean you won't have pain with the Tophet, but it means you're not alone. That's the point. You're not alone. And then on a deep level, whatever you're going through is what you need for your tikkun, is what you need for your soul journey. That's what's scary, my friends. And this is what I'm imploring of you. You have a choice. You can either choose the bitachon way of life. You know, you're not the song like that. You know, you can either have the bitachon way of life, which is you're always with Hashem. Hashem is with you. He'll give you everything you need. It might be not what you want sometimes, but it's everything you need. Or God forbid you could choose the other path, which is you're on your own path. And you're you're totally at the whims and at the resources of these people and of some very unethical people and of your own fears and insecurities. And and because that you're putting your trust in yourself, in others. And that's a scary path, my friend. Don't choose that path. It's a very, very ugly path. It's a very lonely path. Choose the bitachon path. It's, it's, you're never alone in that path. One of the, maybe if you could, um, James, if you could put a link to one of my favorite talks from one of my mentors called Rabbi Lawrence Kellerman. It's called, I think, A Father's Tale. You can find it, I think, on www.simpletoremember.com. I think it's called A Fa- Father's Tale. Or it's you're never alone. This whole talk about you're never alone. It's one of the most magical 90 minutes of spirituality you'll ever experience. Maybe, maybe a simple what? Can just can you simple repeat that? Remember. Simple to remember. It's simple to remember. It's easy to remember, right? So simple to remember.com. Hopefully it should be there, a father's tale. Or it could even be on YouTube. Okay, number one. Number two. Another advantage over alchemy. The second one is because the alchemist needs to perform many difficult activities and tasks without which he can't achieve his goal. He's got to still work long hours mixing the chemicals and eating the metal in them and his effort to turn the metal into gold. And he may be killed by the fumes and the smoke of the burning chemicals due to the constant work and extensive toll with these dangerous materials day and night. So even though he's competent, he's going to earn a livelihood, there's still occupational hazards. But the one who trusts in Hashem to provide your sustenance is safe from occupational hazards. Since he's got no, in, he's no need to engage in harmful work. Basically, if, you, if there's a job that you've been asked to do, which is dangerous for your health, you speak to a rabbi about it, if it was generally dangerous for your health, we wouldn't want you to do that job. Because the Torah says you've got to look after your health. You're not allowed to put your health in danger, even for work. And that anything that has, may Hashem bring him, even if it's unfavorable, will be a source of joy and gladness. Here. Now, this is the point, my friends. This is the, the blessing I wish you. Let's see if you can get to this. See, again, the question has been nagging in my mind. Is it? By the way, you know, my Yitzhahara is 
very, very strong, very active. So when I'm learning this material, my, it's my cynical side is like, come on, Rabbi, really? Everyone with Batoch and everything going amazing. Hmm, not really. I see a lot of very holy looking people who are very sad, who are going through very tough times, awful times, like cheapers. I met one of my dear students, Rabbi Hughes, last week, and he was telling me about his Rav. I was so proud. There was this amazing young boy, Johnny Hughes, who came to me 30 years ago in Golders Green, 25, 24 years ago in Golders Green, and I helped teach him to learn Hebrew and teach him Aleph Beis, to teach him Talmud, and he ended up being an amazing rabbi, and I was able to get him in. He was a genius, and I was able to get him straight into one of the best yeshivas in Israel when he was ready to go. And he learned by this great Moshe Shiva called Rabin Yomin Moskovitz. Rabin Yomin Moskovitz. Rabin Yomin Moskovitz, the Rosh Hashiva of Medrash Shmuel, he's a tzaddik, he's got it often, but he's had hell. He's lost, I think, I think he's lost, I think close to about 11 children. Many of them died in a fire, but then others have died and others have died. And when Rabbi Hughes took his Rosh Hashiva to the cemetery to see his children, the last visit he was here. <laughs> so my friend, a student, Rabbi Hughes, said to Rosh Hashiva, how can you have been talking to Hashem after all that Hashem has done? He's, you know, he's killed nearly all your children. Eleven of your children are killed. That's what it means to have been talking. See, Rosh Hashiva said something on the lines of, Hashem loves me. Hashem loves them. You think, I know more than Hashem? You think, Hashem's made a mistake. Whatever Hashem's done, he's known that's for the good. Obviously, he looked at his children and fulfilled their potential and fulfilled their tikkun. They're now with Hashem. I think he said something on the lines of, I should be upset. My children are now with Hashem. I should want them in this world. They're with Hashem. They're in Gan Eden. In other words, he had such a level of bitachon that even the, lo the loss of so many of his children, he's seen that as another act of love that Hashem has done for him and his family. That's intense, my friends. I am nowhere, I was nowhere near that. I'm nothing to do with that. I'm not on that level whatsoever. I'm not playing that game, right? But he's the tzaddik that can play that. He's on that level, like Rabbi Yochan in the Gemara. Also lost, lost 10 kids. And when they asked him, how do you cope with it? He kept the bones of it, kept a bone of each kid around his neck. And he had a necklace with all his bones of his kids. And he said, why? Because now when someone else goes to tragedy, I can say, I understand where you're coming from. Look. These are my children here around my neck. I can feel your pain. But Hashem, Hashem is with you. Hashem loves you. So these great Sadiqim are able, and this is one of Rabbi Yom and in our generation, they're able to go through hell, but see it as a kiss from Hashem. Don't ask me how, but they're able to. That's the benefit we're talking to now for us mere mortals. When let's say we lose a business opportunity or we lose an apartment we're looking for, or we lose, a door closes and it, literally a door shuts on our finger. We hurt ourselves. At least let's try and look at that from that prism of Bitofen. Let's at least look at that and say, that was a kiss from Hashem. We're not on the level to see tragedy and say that was a kiss from Hashem. We're not playing that game yet. Please God, maybe hopefully, in a way, I don't know if I should say hopefully ne never, because we should be wanting to grow Bitofen, but we should never want tragedy. But the point is that the Sadiq can have tragedy and look at it as a kiss from Hashem. At least we, my friends, at least we can look at a little challenge in our life, a hurdle, a, 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 a something inconvenient, something uncomfortable, something problematic happens. Let's look at that as a kiss from Hashem. Because when you really have bitachon, then you know everything's doing, everything Hashem's giving for joy, for love. He brings actually a verse. Another verse from Psalms 23, where he says, the famous line from King David. Hashem is my, she my shepherd, I shall not lack. In lush meadows, he lays me down. Beside tranquil waters, he leads me. Hashem just wants to lay you down. Hashem just wants you to sleep like a baby. Last night, I didn't sleep, sleep like a baby. I was having horrible dreams last night. So obviously it means I, I wasn't in a, in a bitachon place. I need to do tshuva. I need to work on it. That's why I'm learning this material. Hashem is trying to help me have better dreams. Because really, Hashem just wants to lay you down by the meadows, like you're sunbathing and you're just relaxing. Come on, it's a beautiful weekend in England, for those who are in England. 
you should be able to sunbathe, listening to some nice Urim Kitty this week, listening to some nice talks, looking at this without worrying about anything. That's what Hashem wants you to do. Even if we're going through a seeming, seemingly difficult time, that's what Hashem wants you to do. He wants to lay you down in the meadow. Number three, third advantage over the alchemist. The alchemist cannot trust anyone. And by the way, if you think well, who's the, in this generation, I don't want to offend people, but people maybe with like unethical jobs, a little bit immoral stuff, where people are making money through gambling, through dodgy means, that money's coming easy. So what's the advantage of Bitochen over that? Because the, the alchemist still is very fearful, especially the criminals, the criminal gangs. Yes, they could make easy money, but one day they could be shot. You know, if you ever watch any mafia films, never ends well. You know, he's always dead in the end, right? You always end up with a the horse in their beds and, and with the bullets in, you know, through the, through, that's it. It's, it's never a good ending. And there must be tremendous fear, like it's not cracked up what it's meant to be. They're always looking right behind their shoulders. It's the day the day when someone's going to kill me. Or it's the day the day the police are going to come. Or it's the day the day when my so-called friends are going to give me up. Must There's actually a downside of, of the criminal activity. But one who trusts in Hashem isn't afraid of anyone. On the contrary, he's proud of it. And this is why I'd love you to be. I'd love you to be proud of the talk. Another line from King David, chapter 56. By the way, you see the fact that he's, he keeps on, keeps on bringing proofs from Tehillim, shows us the importance of Tehillim. My friends, I really urge you to say more Tehillim. I'm very into every month, complete the Tehillim. 150 verses every month. You know, that's why I try and do There's 150 chapters of Tehillim. I try every month to so Tamil's now. So I try and keep up with the day, right? So you know, the, wherever we are, today is now, what, the 11th of Tamil's. So if you look in the Tehillim, day 11, whatever you need to do, try and finish every month because it really helps. As King David says, If you have trust in Hashem, what can man do to me? No one can touch you if you have Bitochen. You know, like in the Mafia films, like he's an untouchable. He can't be touched. I've got news for you. If you have Bitochen, you can't be touched. And if you are touched, it came from Hashem. It came because Hashem decided that's what you need. Meaning when you're playing the Bitochen game, no one with their free will even can interfere with your spiritual path. Mm -mm. Your spiritual path is designed, orchestrated only what you need to fulfill your mission. No one can get in the way of that. No one. And here I'm going to share with you something very important. Some people say to me, Rabbi, you're very, very um, idealistic. That's like when I get, that's like uh, when I get a compliment, which is normally like a patronizing compliment. You know, very idealistic. And come on, in the real life, it doesn't work that way. You know, last week, you know, I had a business um, opponent who stole some of my clients. Who stole my clients? Because it's a dastardly world out there. People, you can't trust people. And that guy, I hate him now because he stole some of my clients. So the Gemara says, if you have Bitochen, that can never happen. Meaning, yes, people can steal your clients, but only if Hashem has decided. Meaning, this is the famous phrase in the Talmud. Listen to this. No one, is no one has the ability to touch even a penny of your money. That's it. Meaning, Hashem decides at the beginning of every year, Rosh Hashanah, you're going to earn, Cyril, he says, Cyril, you're going to earn 80,000 pounds this year, let's say. 80,000 pounds. If he says that in Rosh Hashanah and you live up to it with Bitochen, that means that even, let's say, you could have your employer. Oh, all of a sudden doesn't like you. Maybe he finds out, you know, you're doing too much Jewish things. You're doing too much Torah stuff and he doesn't like it. So he says, Cyril, get lost. I don't want you anymore. He has not the ability to take away the end of the year, you getting 80,000 pounds. So even if he decides he's not going to pay you, then Hashem will send you someone else who will. Because what's guaranteed is if Hashem has decided you get 80, you have to, you get 80, no one can take what you have. That's what the Gemara says. You're 80, no one has the ability to take what you have. We don't have a concept that someone can steal a client and take away your business. And therefore, you'll now have less as a result of that person. We don't believe in it. It's untrue. It's impossible. What can happen is maybe Hashem decides you're not going to have 80. You're going to only have 50. Or only, God forbid, have 10. 
or have 200. But whatever Hashem decides, that's what you're going to get. And no one can take your money ever. And by the way, no one can take anything of your possessions ever unless Hashem has decided that that's part of your spiritual challenge. Do you understand? So therefore, we shouldn't be so threatened by people. And we shouldn't therefore have grudges and get upset with people and want to sue them because at the end of the day, they're not taking what you have. Maybe Hashem is taking back what he lent to you because maybe you weren't doing what you were meant to do with it. Very deep idea. And I was with Rabbi Tatz yesterday and he was giving a beautiful talk how even our body is not ours. Our body's not ours. So much so that in Jewish, in Jewish, in the Torah's view, that if, if you if you say to the doctor, I don't want treatment, and the, and the doctor knows and the rabbi knows that without treatment you're going to die, you're not really in the position to say, I don't, I want to withhold treatment. In Jewish law, we have to give you treatment. We have to say you're not in your right mind because your body is not yours. Everything's Hashem's, everything's on loan from Hashem. So sometimes Hashem will loan you something. If you're not using it right, Hashem will I'll take it back. But the point is, it's not. Yenem. It's not Johnny Blogs. It's not, you know, Pete down the road that can take your valuables. Impossible. Once you're protected from the bubble and cocoon of Bitachoy. And that is point number three. Point number three. Let's say this word again. In Hashem, I have trusted, I shall not fear. What man would do me? No one can touch me. No one can touch me. I'm untouchable. And finally, the fourth advantage of Bitachon over alchemy. The fourth way in which a person with the talking is better off is that the, the alchemist cannot avoid doing one of two things. He can either prepare a large quantity of gold and silver to be available to him for future needs, or he can limit his production and not prepare anything extra, only the amount that he needs to sustain him for the short term. But neither of these options provide him with a true sense of financial security because if he prepares a lot of gold and silver in advance, he will be in a constant state of anxiety, worried that he will not lose in any various ways the one's fortune can be lost. And in addition, his heart will never be calm. If on the other hand, he does not prepare gold or silver and only meet the meats for the short term, then it's possible when he needs the money most, he'll be prevented from practicing his craft. But someone who has betoken in Hashem, then you're free because there's no short term or long term. When you have betoken in Hashem, you're okay. You have to get into the, and this is very interesting. How, many, how do you live, everybody? Do you live that you need enough money in the bank account for today, for this week, for this month, for this year, for 10 years? Everyone's got a different level of emotional capacity where they say, I need X amount of money. There was a tzaddik that would never have more in his house than what he needed for that day. That was it. So if ever money came into his house, more than what he needed that day, he would give it away for charity. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? So if you've got money, you know, so all of you, let's say you've got some say, the concept of savings, the big tzaddik, and they don't really have it. There's money, that means that Hashem wants to spend it straight away on people who need it for today. Because there's people out there that can't eat tonight. And there's people out there that are homeless tonight. And there's people out there um, that they're in deep need. There could be a wedding tomorrow that they haven't got to be paid for yet. So there's money there, let's utilize it. So what we're getting at is with someone with real bitachon, we shouldn't have to have this guarantee that I need financial security. You know, I had a friend of mine that had millions put away in Iceland, as we spoke about last week, in a bank in Iceland, and he went kaput. He lost millions. So it just shows there's no such thing as financial security. The only thing you can have is bitachon. And when you have trust, then we're not playing the short term or the long term game. You're living in the day. You're living in the now. Am I all right today? Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. I'm okay today. If you're okay today, now you might say I'm not on that level. I need to be okay all week. Or I need to be okay, even to be okay all year if you want that. But I'm trying to get you to start thinking. You don't have to say I need to be okay for the rest of my life. Right now. We don't even know when we're not going to be here anymore. So many people are or spending so much time making money for when they retire and they never make it to retirement and they miss out on so much of their life. Let's not make that mistake. Let's, let's maximize every day. Let's live every day to our maximum. Optimize it as many mitzvahs as we can do every day, as much goodness as we can bring in every day. And that's one of the amazing, amazing benefits with Bitochen. So we'll stop there.